This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. To kick things off on this show today, do you really think foster care is safe? Well, our friends at Legally Kidnap came up with a little video to show us just exactly how safe foster care is. Let's go to Legally Kidnap and the Foster Monster. Thank you, Legally Kidnap. Our guest at this time is Queen of Hackney. Let me tell you, people, once CPS comes into your life, you're hounded for the rest of your life. This is the case of Queen of Hackney, another case out of the Kent County Family Court system. I'd like to uh, 
see who else we've got here. Um, Queena Hackney, would you like to come next? Very complicated story. Um, it started in September of 2007 when I had an allegation of medical neglect that my daughter was missing her medical appointments. Um, CPS immediately came into my home and removed my child, um, placed her in foster care, made my other three children temporary wards of the court. Um, set me up on a treatment plan, uh, promised to give me my children back, um, tried to make a deal with me to choose between my children. They said that I can keep uh, my three healthy girls if I gave them my medically fragile child. I was not willing, um, so therefore they went for termination. Um, but although my girls, um, my healthy girls were in my home since they were temporary wards of the court, an incident happened um, June, June 20th of 2008 um, where they said that I tried to commit suicide. I did not try to commit suicide. I did not swallow any pills. I never seen a doctor for getting my stomach pumped or anything like that, but that um, initiated the removal of my three healthy girls. Um, the judge, well, the referee stated that the children should go with family. Um, they were never with family. Um, six months later, they were adopted out um, to unknown people. I'm not sure where they are. Um, I have not seen them. My medically fragile child has hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain. She has three shunts. She has a tracheotomy. She has a seizure disorder, she has cerebral palsy, she has a G-tube, she has never walked, she's never eaten. Um, she wasn't supposed to live past 33 days old, so the doctors say, but you know, I don't know if she's still here with me. I haven't seen my girls in four years, but six months after they terminated my parental rights, I had another son where I went out of the state to have him to protect him so they wouldn't take him from me and came back because this is where I live, this is where my family is and they tried to take my son again. Um, they did not succeed because they gave me transportation money to go back to the state where my son was born so they wouldn't have to have a petition to take him out of my care. Um, sent the sheriff department there in Clay County in Mississippi where I was living to verify that I was there and two weeks later closed my case. I let the situation die down and came back to Michigan, had another baby, CPS tried to take her. I still have two children in my custody, um, although my parental rights were terminated. Um, like I said, I don't understand what happened. I don't understand where this went wrong. I do know that there are a couple of people who are who I hold accountable for this, and that's um, Kathy Cornelius, and she's formerly known as Kathy Murphy. She's a DA Blodgett foster care worker. She has resigned. Um, her Cla her supervisor, Claudia Treestrom, is still th still the supervisor. I did an appeal, um, and this is what I wanted to read to you um, because I still don't understand what it means. But what my appeal lawyer told me is that. It is clear from the evidence presented in this case that it is not in the best interest of the minor child to terminate Queen's parental rights. The Michigan Supreme Court has held that a parent whose parental rights have not been legally severed should be given society's assistance at every point in effort to reestablish a proper home for the children. The prosecutor in drafting the termination petition realized the weakness of her case and cited every statutory basis imaginable to terminate Queen's parental rights in the hope that one could be proved by clear and convincing evidence. The termination petition cites seven different statutory grounds for termination of parental rights. The trial court found that the state had failed to prove four of the statutory basis to terminate Queen's rights. However, Judge Gardner found that there was a statutory basis to terminate Queen's parental rights. Under 19B3CI, a trial court may terminate parental rights if the conditions that led to the adjudication continue to exist and there is no reasonable likelihood that the conditions will be rectified within a reasonable time considering the child's age. Judge Gardner clearly erred in terminating Queen's parental rights on this basis. The initial... 
a little bit louder. Hear me now. The initial petition was authorized because of Quina's inability to care for her medically fragile child's needs. Quina has attached to the brief as an exhibit a letter that outlines the extraordinary care that is required for her child. Even the foster parents who are licensed medical professionals licensed medical professionals were unable to provide the level of care that is necessary and Akela has been removed from several foster care homes the undisputed testimony show that after my medically fragile child was removed that I provided appropriate care for my other three children if the community provided appropriate medical assistance Queena would be able to care for Akela in her home the court should not interpret 19 b 3 ci to allow the state to terminate a parent's parental rights to a child who has extraordinary medical needs that an appropriate parent would be unable to meet without substantial medica medical assistance, which is not available. Further, the undisputed testimony showed that Quina provided appropriate care for her other children. The, the trial court erred in finding this statutory basis had been proved by clear and convincing evidence. The evidence clearly showed that Queena provided appropriate care for her other three daughters. Um, at the February 17th hearing, referee McNabb let my children reside with me. After my fourth daughter was born, the court allowed her to come home from the hospital to live with me. At another adjudication, the case manager testified that my children were well cared for in my home. Ms. Cornelius, also former known as Kathy Murphy, gave similar testimony that my children were appropriately taken care of. Even at the termination hearing, Ms. Cornelius, formerly known as Ms. Murphy, testified that the children had been receiving appropriate care in their mother's home. Since Queena has always provided appropriate care for her girls, the trial court clearly abused its discretion in holding that Queena would be unable to provide appropriate care in a reasonable period of time. The third, the third statutory basis used by the trial court to terminate Queena's parental rights was the, the, okay, hold on. Well, I'm just gonna start here. It says, the prosecutor failed to state in her closing argument what conduct or capacity of Queena would cause a reasonable likelihood of harm if the children were returned to her home. The trial court did not state in her oral opinion and appellate counsel is unable to determine what evidence supports this findings. The testimony at the termination hearing showed that the children were never physically harmed while in their mother's care. Further, there was no evidence that Queena did not provide the children with adequate food, clothing, or shelter. The state has failed to prove this statutory basis by clear and convincing evidence. The totality of the evidence further shows that it is, that it is not in the best interest of the children to have their mother's parental rights terminated. The undisputed testimony by Judge Gardner was that Queena loves her children and there exists a strong bond of love and affection between the children and their mother. The social worker also testified that the children have a good, strong bond, loving relationship with their mother. The children acted out emotionally after being removed from her care. To sever this bond will cause untold psychological damage, damage to these children. My whole thing, I guess, is that I didn't understand how they could say these good things about me and then still terminate my rights. My whole other thing is how you can say I'm a bad mother when I have two children in my care right now that you thoroughly came into my home and investigated and you closed my case. I don't understand why they told me that if my daughter ever died, I would never be invited to her funeral. I don't understand. I don't know who to talk to. I just know that I have to keep praying and keep fighting because my children matter to me the most. This whole system is corrupted. The DA Blodgett social workers, from Kathy Cornelius to Claudia Treestrom, Linda Broom, Rhonda Boss at DeVos Pediatrics, everybody is corrupted to me because they promised me something and they didn't fulfill their end of the agreement. And I did everything they requested me to do. And not to mention the physical abuse when they hit my daughter in the mouth, the foster care lady admitted to it. She admitted that she hit my daughter in the mouth and she apologized. They gave her eight hours of parenting classes while I took 18 weeks and there was no physical abuse or anything. So I just hope that everybody story is heard. I hope that justice is served. Um, I just graduated in May with an Associates of Arts in Criminal Justice. I'm currently enrolled in my bachelor's degree program. This is only to literate myself on what is actually going on because I didn't know. I was counseled to plead guilty. I didn't know that my children weren't never going to come home and see me. I thought if I did what they told me to do, if I cooperated, then everything would go fine. But now my life is destroyed and it won't be fixed until they come home. All right, thank you, Queen.
Let's go back to our whistleblower event that we had uh, last summer. This is a story from Judy. At one time, Judy had a typical all-American family. A family that attended church, boys and Girl Scouts. This family was active in the community. Judy did everything right until CPS came into their lives. Judy thought they would help her family, but Judy was wrong. Judy tells her story out of Elegant County, Michigan. Judy Krantz, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Judy Krantz come and tell us a little bit about her case. Um, was not a pleasant thing. It was not pleasant at all. So Judy's from Allegan County. So thank you. Hello, my name is Judy. I'm gonna try not to fall like a baby. But um it's been one year since I lost my parental rights. This July at a family reunion, I was able to see my son Jack face to face for the first time in over a year with the meeting being supervised. However, I've been not permitted to see my daughter Brandy at all. This is my story. I have been a mother to five children and two stepchildren. My family participated in regular church attendance. Education was a priority in our house. I attended parent-teacher conferences, muffins for moms, and other school activities. My sons played sports and my daughters were in Girl Scouts. Family vacations included trips to amusement parks cross-country trips to visit relatives, and trips to explore historical sites. Now these are all the memories that I have. I have been a nurse for over 25 years. I opened a free clinic for uninsured adults and homeless in a, where we lived in that area in 2007. It was a critical need in our community and I felt that with some wonderful volunteers, we could answer that need. The clinic is still in operation today, serving the poor and the homeless. Three years ago, my 12-year-old da daughter accused my now ex-husband of sexual abuse. When I found out, I told my husband to leave and called my pastor and the police immediately. I was unable to reach the city police the small town. with two policemen. So I took Brandy to the sheriff's department and filed a report. I cannot express in words the shock and horror I felt as the situation unfolded. I sat next to my daughter holding her and crying. It just kept repeating that I was so sorry. A detective contacted me a few days later and set up a meeting. CPS interviewed me in the meeting and I reiterated what Brandy had told me about it. CPS asked me if I believed her and I told them I support her completely. I then requested counseling for my daughter and my family. A contracted CPS counselor came to my house to talk with me. I had never witnessed any of the abuse and his time with the children was so limited that I never suspected any. I supported my daughter 100%, I told her. The counselor says, stated that I had to say that he had done it in order to keep custody of the children. I took Brandy to her counseling sessions, helped devise ways to help her to ease her anxiety when testifying, and I held her every day. The counselor reported to CPS that I did not believe my daughter. Each case review, the CPS worker would report that I was a problem because I only believed my daughter 99%. At 1.5 months in the investigation, I still could not say I witnessed anything, but continued to help my daughter through her pain. CPS stated they wanted to remove the children for two weeks for a cool down period. They threatened they would terminate my rights if I did not agree to it. There had been no charges of abuse nor neglect against me, so they could not remove the children from the house on that basis. So getting me to agree to this was their way of getting around that obstacle. This gave, the, uh, this gave them the ability to make my children wards of the state, although I did not know that at the time. With my daughter crying in my, ars, my arms, I agreed to it. They promised I could have liberal visitation and could talk to both my children whenever possible. That was just the beginning of the nightmare with CPS. The reality was I, re I received two supervised hours a week and could talk to them three times a week for 15 minutes at a time. I was devastated and went before a judge to change it and make CPS keep their word. CPS reported they had no resources to let me see my children more frequently. We proposed various people to supervise, including family members, counselors, and even a state rep. 
but the judge left it up to CPS. CPS refused to even investigate the list. My relationship with my children began to break down. Do you have any idea what it's like to live in fear every moment of losing your children, both physically and emotionally? There's no time for sanity or well-formed decisions, only terrible fear and the inability to breathe. It is because of this state that CPS is able to manipulate you. They dangle your children in front of you, forcing you into a state of perpetual panic. The counselor said I was making real progress, and she was advising CPS to give me unsupervised visits and reports. I asked her for a copy of her report, and none of that was on her report. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I got to get a hold of the real report of it. Obviously, I don't have the, you know, the whole report, so I emailed her and asked her to send me the full report. It didn't say anything that she had said it said. It only said that I needed more counseling. So I dumped her. I got a hold of CPS and said, I don't want her. I can't trust her. She's been lying to me. I went to Pine Rest for counseling. My daughter told me at one of the visits that the CPS counselor, which had my mind also, had told her that the fact that I had changed counselors was not in my favor. She said everyone, including CPS and her counselor, had told her I was going to be terminated. Brandy begged me to accept the voluntar voluntary termination they would offer when it came time. As the months progressed, CPS did not extend my visitation until a month prior to the trial of my ex-husband. At the next case review, they maintained that I was doing much better and that I was progressing toward unsupervised visits. I asked the court not to make me testify, but the defense subpoenaed me because I had not witnessed anything. Within two weeks after the date of my testimony, termination proceedings began, even though CPS stated that I was moving toward weekend visitations. CPS stated in court that they had, quote, exhausted every possibility for unification unquote, and advised termination. I will never forget those words. CPS told me that if I did not take a voluntary termination, which would enable me to be able to still see my children, I would be terminated and never see them until they were 18 years old. They stated they would bring criminal charges. I took the voluntary termination thinking at least I would be able to see them. Both children were put into group homes for a year and I repeatedly asked to see them, even supervised. I begged the agencies to let me be involved in their counseling process, and CPS refused. In this past year, I have only seen Jack at the family reunion, and I haven't seen Brandy at all. My son Jack is now with my second son, who is an ex-Marine and is attending college to become an agricultural engineer while working full-time. My daughter Brandy is with my oldest daughter, who is an alcoholic, abusive lesbian who cannot hold a job for more than six months at a time. I have been in contact with CPS requesting over and over to see Brandy, even if supervised. She is in Kentucky, and I stated I would drive down there even if I could see her for supervised for one hour a week. <laughs> I am a junior at Grand Valley State University, majoring in psychology. I am fully intending to start a nonprofit agency when I graduate that shields women and educates them about CPS so that they do not stand alone in the shock and terror. At this point, they have no one to speak for them while CPS rips their family in shreds under the guise of protecting their children. And I don't mean these agencies, but they can't show up and hold your hand. You know, that's what I want. I want a group of people together to be able to hold their hand and not be able to be manipulated by CPS. I did not want to come today. Reliving the nightmare is something I do every day. This has been emotionally devastating for me, and I had at one point considered suicide. My children were every me, and it tore me apart to think I could not be there for my Brandy and Jack as they went through this horror. So I'm begging people not to walk away anymore, to, to stand up and do something about a system that would do this to our families. Uh, let the pain and anger motivate you to do something and protect our little ones. Um, I, I'm going to give this to the aid a copy of it but that's pictures of my kids and my email address is on there in case you have any questions you know and want to follow up with me okay thank you so much thank you judy um i met judy through uh, citizens for parental rights and uh, she and her husband came to some meetings uh early on and then uh i mentioned already a, a, a 
counseling degree at uh, Cornerstone while I had to do internship, uh, actually three semesters of internship. And so uh, looking for a place to do that and found the clinic that Judy had started. Uh, Judy's standing here in tears and I want you to understand that Judy is not a weak person. She is not a crybaby. She knows how to cry, but um, Judy started a health clinic, uh, a free health clinic, and it's something that where there's a, a tremendous need for it. Uh, she's a strong person. She's a decent person. Uh, I wasn't aware of any uh, allegations of, of Judy uh, uh, being guilty of, of abuse, but certainly I, I do believe that uh, Child Protective Services abused their power and put her in a position where she had to choose between a rock and a hard place. And she, she chose to a, a position where she could at least see her daughter. Now you just heard, and I was in the, uh, I went to the, to the hearing for that, and uh, it was negotiated in the hallway, um, and, and that's what Judy agreed to. But uh, it wasn't a fun thing, but that's been a while, and you heard Judy say she still hasn't been able to see her daughter in a year. So um, we've got a situation here that needs fixing. You heard Judy say uh, she really didn't want to be here and say this. She didn't really want to, want to tell her story. She hurts yet but she's choosing to do something constructive with it not let the hurt go to waste but to uh, you know make make something good out of it so. I want to thank you for watching the program tonight you can tune in next week at the same time and view another edition of silent voices I want to remind everybody that we have citizens for parental rights meetings right here at the studio at WKTV 5261 Clyde Park Avenue, right here in Wyoming, Michigan. That's every third Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. Hope you can come out and join us. I also, if uh, you like to join a social network, you can join our network at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. If you'd like to be a guest on this program, or send us an email with some comments, you can send that to us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrightsgmail.com. Once again, thank you for watching the program. And remember, until next time, your voice can make the difference.